Hi, and welcome to the Connie Pillage Show. I'm State Representative Connie Pillage, your hostess for today. Many of my viewers know that I work a great deal on military issues and veterans issues. Today we're going to talk about something that's very unique to military families, the military children. And with me today to talk about this, I have Dr. Teresa Ferrari from Ohio 4-H and Len Klackalak from the Ohio National Guard. Welcome. Thanks, Connie. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here because we're going to talk yeah. about some really cool things and, and you two are uniquely positioned to talk about Ohio's military kids. And um, I would like you to tell me how it is you know about that. I, we'll start with Len because he's easy. He's, he's in the <laughs> National Guard. Well, yeah, I'm actually the education outreach specialist, so it's a fairly new position, but um, I spent a lot of years in education, 20 years in education, and now I have the privilege and the honor of servicing military children in the public schools and trying to make sure that they receive the resources and information and are aware of all the opportunities that are out there for their families and their schools. And Teresa, you're with 4-H. Right. What are you doing with military <laughs> children? Well, it's something that we've actually been involved with for about the past 10 years and an uh, initiative through Operation Military Kids, which is a national program that we became involved in as a way to reach out to the kids uh, throughout Ohio. Okay. Well, let's start talking about uh, military children. You're talking about all these military children throughout Ohio. We're here in Cincinnati. We have a reserve. We have an Air National Guard base. We've got Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So that's pretty much it, right? Not even close. <laughs> not even close. No, not close at all. You actually have the largest concentration of military families is in southwestern Ohio because of the things that you mentioned. But there's also many, you might call them hidden, uh, military families because they are civilian soldiers. They are, for the most part, they're working civilian jobs, but they are also in the National Guard and the Reserves. And well, how many kids are we talking about? How many military kids are we talking well, we've about? We've got nearly 33,000 military kids in Ohio, and that's one of the larger concentrations. We're not a huge military state like Texas or California or Virginia, but our National Guard uh, is very large, uh, I believe the fifth largest in the country, so we have quite a few military kids. And are these children mostly located then near Wright Pat and in Cincinnati by the bases we talked about? You'd be surprised. Uh, the truth of the matter is there are military children and families in every single county in Ohio. Um, we, I use uh, an example of Knox County. There is absolutely no active base there. There's no armory. And yet there are uh, over 200 military children in that county. And that 33,000 number is, uh, those are numbers that are specifically dependents of our service members in, in uniform. That doesn't count uh, brothers, sisters, extended family, so on. So that number is actually even bigger than 33,000 if we get right down to it. So we have <clears throat> military children in every county. Clearly they are not all attached to the active duty base in, in the Dayton area. Correct. Right. So they must be reserve or guard. Correct. So One thing that I, I think that surprises people and it surprised me when I first came into this position is that the average uh, military connected youth, the people that we service, um, they're, they're probably an average of 60 miles from the closest base or where their, their family member reports for duty. So they are dispersed in a lot of rural areas. Okay, so are there, so their, their mom or dad goes to drill if they're in the guard or the reserves, mm -hmm. right? Correct. That okay. the, the one week in a month, the two weeks in the summer that people think of as maybe typical but there are many other times when they may be called uh, to service. So it seems to me that these kids out in these rural areas, or even here in Cincinnati, where we never really think about the Air National Guard base that's just down the road, or the reserve base over in uh, uh, Wood Woodlawn, um, we don't really think of ourselves as a military town. But there, I would imagine this presents some unique issues for the kids of, of those members, the Guard and Reserves. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. I think one of the biggest things that we hear when we do encounter military kids and they, they find out about some of the things that we're doing and they get to meet other military kids, that's a big deal. Because they, even though they may live, as you said, in Cincinnati in a, in a city, they don't know any other military kids or maybe just a few. They don't know if there's anyone else in their school perhaps who is a military child. Maybe their teachers don't even know that they are a military family because they're not it's not anything obvious. It's, they're, they're just like any other kid for the most part. 
because their parent is has a civilian job. They think of their parent in that context, and, and so do their neighbors and, and everybody else, until they're in a position where they are called away, perhaps for a year, uh, to serve their country. There's so many children that we deal with, obviously, with the National Guard and the Reserve that um, they are, they're forced to make that transition. They, they're expected to, to be able to live that civilian life and, and what we would consider normal for most of us. And all of a sudden, with uh, sometimes very little notice, they're all of a sudden a military family and someone's missing and all the things that come with it, the, the fear, the, the uh, just, just not knowing what's going to happen from day to day. But there can't be that many deployments in Ohio. That, well, how often do we go? <laughs> There's actually quite a few. Um, and I think it's just a, it's a continuing cycle. At any given point in time, there are going to be units who are getting ready to deploy, already deployed overseas, and then those who are, who are coming back and in what we would call reintegration. And that actually is the, that reintegration period is what many people now are the most concerned about because it's, it's sort of forever. Um, there may be some things that pop up initially, but even even now they're thinking that even nine months later there may be things that manifest themselves in terms of um, you know different different issues that the family may be dealing with as they try to coalesce back into that into that family and re um, just reassert those dynamics that may have been there before or th things change, and I think sure. that's one of the hardest things is to that there's some kind of change and transition that you're dealing with. You have that with an active duty family if they're moving from location to location. But for the Garden Reserve, that's, it's changed, but it's a different sort. It's having to deal with um, new things, new ways of new configurations in your family. Some children may have to move because, um, because uh, or have a, they a family the member. Family income? Well, or a family member uh, may move, maybe it's a grandparent that comes to live with them because if the parent's deployed, what are they going to do? Um, or a, a two-parent family can become a single-parent family. And if you're a single-parent family, then what are your arrangements for caring for, for your children during that time, if you're gone for a whole year? Well, I can, I'm, I'm imagining this as a parent. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the, the few times that my husband has uh, traveled for business, you know, the first day is hard, but then we get into a new routine. And then he comes back, and everything's changed. Now, this is a simple, undangerous uh, business trip, but when your spouse or your mom or dad has gone to the war zone, that's got to be frightening for kids. What kind of things do they go through and, and what do we need to be on the lookout for? Well, one of the things that we're really focusing on, um, and I know we'll talk more about the month of the military child in Purple Up, but we, we really want educators to be aware uh, of these, uh, these deployments and these, these opportunities, I guess. Um, what would be maybe considered to be a, an above average student, uh, someone who has no, never had problems with attendance or, or grades or behaviors, all of a sudden drop off the edge and, and they can't figure out why. What happened all of a sudden? Well, they're worried if, uh, if mom or dad is coming home again. Uh, they don't know, they, they, sometimes they don't have opportunity to talk to them regularly. They have no idea what's, what's going on. Um, it's, it's tough to deal with, especially depending on the age and anything else that's going on in the family like any other normal child. Right, and I think it does depend on the age of the child too, what they understand about what's going on and what their, um, then what their role becomes in the family. Older children typically have to take on more responsibilities mm -hmm. and that might not seem like a, a really difficult thing, but it is if, if you're a teenager. And they may have to care for younger siblings, pick up more chores around the house. They may not do activities that they're used to doing because of some of the, the changes in, in the dynamics of the family. And they may not feel like doing the things that they've done before. Maybe they always did baseball with their dad, but their dad's not there. So they, they sort of lose interest maybe in some of the things that were things that they like to do. Uh, they, they worry about the parent at home because they see the stress that that parent is under and trying to manage everything else. And, and these parents don't have the support structure that a military installation has. Exactly. They're very distant, perhaps, from those support services. So those services have to be provided by the community. And that's part of what we try to do, is to try to find those community partners who can, can be part of our network of supporting these military kids. Well, so let's talk about Operation Military Kids, which is the, the exciting program that I'm anxious for you to talk about today. 
It's a national program. Right, it is a national Teresa. program, and Ohio has been involved pretty much since the, the beginning, since 2005, so we're actually going into our ninth year, and that's... Uh, so relatively new. Relatively new, but it seems like a, a long time for us, because I guess we weren't sure how long we'd be doing this. Um, it really was in response to the situations that we were just talking about with the Garden Reserve, and... Well, the, and the, the two wars. Right, and the continuing of those, I guess no one really knew how long that would be. And the, the phrase that we was used early on was suddenly military. And they, they all of a sudden overnight, as, as Len was saying, they became a military family. But they didn't know what that meant. 9-11 really changed the whole uh, situation for the Garden Reserve. They had typically not been deployed in overseas types of situations like they are in, in the current uh, conflicts. So that really changed the frequency of deployments, the length of deployments. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, so, but let's talk about yeah. what Operation Military Kids right. does. I, I know that there's all these struggles, <laughs> um, but 4-H is very involved in running this operation, but you right. got to tell me what this operation well, the, is. Well, the reason for that is because we are, 4-H is, is a national program too, and so we were located close to home, if you will, for where the military kids are. And so the idea was that we would develop educational programs and different um, youth development experiences that would support young people during these tr um, tough times of deployment and help to educate the public about the situation because many people were unaware that military kids existed in their communities and what their needs were. Well, sure. And, you know, we have a rich military uh, presence uh, in the Guard and Reserve here in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And most people probably don't know about this program. So what kind of programs do they offer? And does the Guard get involved? Do you work in partnership? Or how does it work? I heard uh, lately uh, one of our uh, co-workers, Captain Franz, describe it the best way I've heard described. And it's, uh, he used the example of Operation Military Kids and the Ohio National Guard as the twist on the top of a bread bag. You don't know which one's which until you get to the very end. We work very well together. Uh, we are one big team. We, we do everything together. We have a great relationship. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, we certainly wouldn't have near the impact that we have if we tried to do it individually. So, yeah. And we do great things. <laughs> Joining forces. Um, one of the things that we started with, and it goes back to the Ohio 4-H connection, is Ohio 4-H is very big into the world of camping. We see that it's a great way to uh, have a positive youth development experience. And so when we sort of married the two, it's like, okay, we know how to do camps, and you have military kids. Let's see if we can do camps for military kids. And we're still doing them <laughs> nine years later. And that has been one of the uh, strongest uh, elements of our program, not because, oh, well, camps. Let's, it, people think campfires and marshmallows. It's really a wonderful way to have an impact on young people's lives. Um, and we've seen these kids grow up, literally, in our camps. The campers, when they get too old to be a camper, are, move into the role of being a camp counselor, which is a great leadership experience. So what are the ages that you typically cater to at, at, a, at a military kids' camp? Well, at a residential camp, we're looking at 9 um, to 15 in our some of our programs. Some of uh, We've now gone on to having camps for teens that would go all the way up to 18. Those are more specialized experiences just for teens. So there's more than one camp. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we used to talk about more it every in year. Singular, singular. I would say we probably have about 15 different experiences this year. In Ohio? In Ohio alone. Mm -hmm. All uh, summer. So you could go to a different one every summer? You pra practically. Yeah. <laughs> we, all right. Well, pretty, tell me about these busy. camps. This is fascinating. Uh, well, we actually have is it one at a coming up. Um, at different campsites around the state, we try to disperse them again um, to kind of be sensitive to where the population is. Some, for some of our younger kids, we have day experiences. We also incorporate parents into those experiences so we can be doing a workshop with parents and having uh, kids having an experience together. I think the biggest thing that we find, both from the campers and the parents alike, is they tell us that the connections that they make with other military kids are the best thing that they get out of these experiences. So the situation of not knowing any other military kids totally goes away when you have a camp full of them. Uh, some kids don't realize that there really are other military kids till they're in a cabin with 10 others and say, wow, um, these other kids are like me. They're going mm -hmm. through similar situations. And those, those connections maintain past the time of the camp, too. And that's so, really good for us to see. And where in Ohio are these camps? Literally everywhere. Um, <laughs> 
we can say that, for instance, uh, we have a couple coming right up here in the Cincinnati area. Okay. We have uh, day camps uh, overnights, actually, at the Cincinnati Zoo coming up the 23rd and the 24th. They can sleep with the manatee, and the kids will, will do some programming there. We'll take the parents and do some programming with them for resiliency and, and uh, get them some information that hopefully will help them out with uh, upcoming deployments. Um, then in the afternoon and the evening, they get to go to the zoo together and have some fun. Um, the Friday after that, the 29th, I'm a big hockey fan, and I have got some friends who play for the Cincinnati Cyclones, and we've got an opportunity for some families to come out to that uh, and uh, meet some of the players afterwards even. But uh, the, the camps, we have them up, uh, our biggest one is Kelly's Island. That's I'll right. let Teresa talk about that. Yeah. That's her baby. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I want to hear about that. I've been to Kelly's Island. It's great. It's up in Lake Erie. Yes, and it's um, even though it's in the northern part of the state, we have kids from all over the state who come. We It's our largest. Uh, we've got 260 kids there all together, more or less. What ages are uh, nine, well, We have 9 to 11 and 12 to 15. We okay. actually have them at two different sites, the two youth camps that are on the island. One's a 4-H camp and one's a church camp. And we sort of take over the island we for, for the, the island. week. <laughs> we invade, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and we have um, probably one, well, about 70 counselors because we also have counselors in training. The younger counselors are, or the younger kids are brought into that role, and um, we just we have a blast. Um, we I think we like it maybe more than the kids. Yeah. <laughs> oh. uh, it's, we, we always pray for good weather, but we do a lot of things that you know take advantage of being on Lake Erie. We also have elements of military culture that are woven into the camp in a way that's very, I would say, subtle. Um, it's On the surface, it would look like any other um, camp, residential camp experience, but the fact that everyone is a military kid, we like to um, Pay attention to that and make sure that they are also aware of the types of things that their parents get to do by having service members embedded in to the staff uh, of the camp. One of the other things that's really popular uh, that we've done is family camps. Yes. And that allows us to take, really, we've literally had people carrying babies um, and have brought them to camap and grandparents, um, what an extended family, whatever that family defines as their family. And they come for a weekend at a camp, either up, maybe up on Lake Erie, down here in southwest right, Ohio. Well, let's talk about that definition of family. Suppose you got the 19-year-old kid who isn't married and has no children because he's only a teenager, but he's got parents. Mm -hmm. Can they go to the family camp? We absolutely have had that kind of family okay. at our family camp. Yep, a single and service member with parents. Were they parents. glad they went? They were. Okay. They were up on Lake Erie, and they got to do all kinds of cool water sports, and they... They blended right in with the, all the rest of the families. The family camps, I think, are some of our most rewarding mm -hmm. as far as how it impacts uh, the entire family. Uh, that may sound redundant, but really, uh, you know, we talked earlier that uh, the statistics show us that um, when a deployment cycle comes around, I think the average person might believe that it's hardest when you find out about her when the, when the service member is actually gone for that year. But it's showing us that it's when they return, that reintegration, getting things back to a quote-unquote normal is the toughest part, and we've heard from several of these families who get the opportunity. This is the first time that they've had nothing on the outside, no stresses, nothing to deal with, other than being a family again. And There's it's great no TV. To see. <laughs> Someone's making your meals. Yeah, you're sleeping in a cabin, but and you're but you're surrounded by beauty, uh, the, our beautiful natural environment that we have here in Ohio, and you're meeting other families, and it's it's that just that informal interaction that really kind of takes care of itself by just providing the space for people to have quality time together. And they really see that as a gift and are so thankful for that. And it's, it's great to be able to give that to, to families. It, it seems like there's a lot of room for growth, though, because there have got to be more than 250 service members who deploy. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think we could always, uh, we always try to, we involve volunteers so that we extend our efforts. Uh, so we can do and, and reach as many families as possible, but it's uh, it's a it's it's a full time job for sure. Um, since 9/11, I know we've had at least 21,000 service members deployed in the National Guard alone from that's Ohio, just Ohio, mm -hmm. and that's just the, just National, the National Guard. Just the National Guard. So that's not counting the reserves. That's not counting um, the active duty. Mm -hmm. And at any given point in time, I'd say we have probably a couple thousand two to 3,000 young people who are affected by deployment. But that's a cumulative number because okay. it's been ongoing for the past 10 years. Well, let's talk a little bit about April. You and I are wearing yes, our purple we are. today. <laughs> uh, and, and for a special reason. Yes, it is. Um, April is the month of the military child, and purple is the color 
that represents all the different branches of the service. We've got a we've got a T-shirt here. And we have a purple up T-shirt. If Jen can, can so look that's at what that. we're uh, promoting in April. We're purple, and when people that's ask great. you why, you can tell them. Uh, so we are trying to do a lot of different things to accomplish some of our goals, like raising awareness. Uh, we actually are having a 5K um, up in Columbus during that time, so that we're promoting some healthy activities and at the same time raising awareness. Um, well, and, and, and we've had some just great opportunities with people who have stepped up and, and partnered with us to make this happen and, and to raise the awareness. Uh, just to name a couple, I've uh, been very fortunate with some of our connections with the Ohio Department of Education and uh, they are actually allowing Teresa and I to put together an informational webinar for all of the educators throughout the state so that they are aware of these programs and how to identify military children and opportunities to help them. Um, we've partnered with the Ohio PTA as well. We prepackaged some activities and flyers and opportunities for all of the schools and communities to... to libraries. Libraries, yeah, they're going to have... Uh, we've given them a recommended book list, so each week there'll be books in each of the school libraries to, to promote uh, pride in the military and the military children who go there. So Did we say why we chose purple or why you chose purple? Purple is the color that it represents all the different branches of the service. It's not any, you know, we associate Army Green or uh, Air Force Blue, but this really is something that cuts across all that. So when we say an event is purple or we, our programs are purple, we mean that they serve all branches okay. of the military. And you have a website that talks about uh, Ohio Military Kids Camp, right? Yes, we do. Um, our website is uh, simple and short. If you can remember the OSU connection, it's go.osu dot edu slash omk and there well, you can easy. that's pretty easy to remember and and you can find information about what len was talking about what some of the purple up activities as well as all of the different programs the camps and the registration links are all there uh, on our website we also have a facebook page we have a twitter twitter account. facebook is ohio operation. Uh, ohio operation military kids if you search on that you'll find us and we okay. have regular posts about our activities and and keep people up to date on resources that are available for military families so wherever i am in ohio i can go to facebook mm -hmm. and go to ohio operation military kids and i can learn maybe i can learn what's going on in my quadrant of the state, my corner Absolutely. of the state. Right. And see all the smiling faces of those wonderful young people too. Yeah. The um, I, the last thing I want to ask you before we go, and we only have a few seconds left, how is Military Kids Camp paid for? Lots of generous contributions. Okay. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the USO of Central and Southern Ohio. They are a long-standing donor for us and a very um, giving us lots of money to make this possible. That's great. Well, thank you, uh, Teresa and Len, for being here and talking about military kids. Who knew they had such a great summer planned for them? I hope all the new military kids who are, who are, uh, whose parents are new to the, to the Guard and Reserves to make sure they sign up. Thanks, and we'll thank be you. right back for our legislative update. Search and rescue. Wherever we're needed, we're there. That's what the National Guard is all about. I use the skills that I learn in the Guard every day. The National Guard is paying for my college and books. Everything is well covered. We became a team at Ground Zero. Bosnia. Afghanistan. And Iraq. This is your brother, this is your sister. You gotta look out for each other. I would do it again. And I would do the mission. That's my duty. That's my responsibility. I'm proud to be in the National Guard. Visit 1-800-GoGuard.com. Welcome back, and thanks for staying tuned for my legislative update. Over a hundred bills have been introduced into the Ohio House of Representatives since we convened on January 7th. But one item that is causing a ruckus in Columbus stems from a bill not uh, from this term, but from the previous term. House Bill 1 passed in 2011. That's the bill that created Jobs Ohio, a public-private partnership that took over the state's Department of Development. The Department of Development is charged with spearheading economic development across the state. Jobs Ohio was initially funded with $1 million appropriated by the General Assembly. So you can imagine our surprise when we learned that Jobs Ohio actually received another $5 million in public money. Legislators, including me, 
are demanding to know how Jobs Ohio got the extra money. So far, our questions have gone unanswered. The state auditor is attempting to audit Jobs Ohio, but his efforts are being blocked by Governor Kasich and the Speaker of the House. While we don't have full information at this time, at least one head has rolled from this emerging scandal. The director of the Department of Development has left her job and a replacement has been appointed. He is the fourth to head the agency. The state budget is by far the most sweeping and far-reaching bill that we will consider. It funds all of the state's operations for the next two years. While I cannot possibly whittle down the 4,200-page bill for my report today, here are some highlights. First, the budget increases state spending by $7 billion. This is the largest operating budget in Ohio history. Two, it expands our Medicaid program to include childless adults who earn up to 138% of the federal poverty level. This is an option provided to states under the Affordable Care Act. The federal government will cover 100% of the cost initially for this expansion. Its share, however, will decrease to 90% by the year 2020. Expanding Medicaid provides about $400 million of revenue to our state budget. Three, a dramatic tax shift would change how we pay for things in Ohio. An increase in the sales tax would pay for an Ohio income tax cut that largely benefits the wealthy. So if you go to the movies, get your hair cut, download music, have cable TV, go to the King's Island or get, get a new will, you'd pay more in taxes. The Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce and companies like Procter & Gamble, Duke, 8K Steel, and dozens of others are uniformly against the governor's plan. And fourth, education funding would get a new formula under the new budget. Unfortunately, this formula would not pass constitutional muster, would leave most schools no better off than last year, and would continue to put the squeeze on local property owners. The budget is still in committee and could be passed out of the House by mid-April, so many changes could happen. I have long held the view that veterans' issues should be beyond partisan politics, but I am afraid that even our veterans can escape it no longer. House Bill 55, which I introduced with a colleague from across the aisle, is the latest victim to such grandstanding. The bill would simply help military families by allowing the civilian half of a military couple to collect unemployment when quitting a job because of a military transfer. Ohio is one of only six states to prohibit this. House Bill 55 is supported by the Department of Veterans Services, AMVETS, Vietnam Veterans of America, American Legion, Disabled American Vets Auxiliary 115, and the Adjutant General of, of the Ohio National Guard. The Department of Defense considers this to be among its top priorities for military families, and no one opposed the bill in its three hearings. Yet Chairman Ron Young has killed House Bill 55. It appears that the Republican leadership would rather kill this bill than allow it to go forward with a Democratic legislator's name on it. One can easily see where military families rank in terms of priority in the Ohio House. Thanks for joining me today. Please feel free to call me at my office in Columbus, 614-466-8120 or email me at rep28 at ohiohouse.gov, or stop at my next open office hours in the district and tell me what's on your mind. I'll be at the Buffalo Mountain Coffee House on Monday, April 8th from 7.30 to 9.30 a.m. The address of Buffalo Mountain Coffee is 4074 East Galbraith Road, and that is in Deer Park. I hope to see you there. Thanks for joining.